Hi, I'm Pastor Corey, and you're listening to the Orange United Methodist Sermon Podcast. We're a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that wants to help you find your place in God's story. And we hope this sermon can guide you along that path. Visit orangemethodist.org to find out more information about location, service times, upcoming events, and ways to give. We hope you enjoy. This morning, we've got uh, two scriptures. And both of them are a little bit heavy, uh, as, as Corey was saying earlier, uh, just heavy on our hearts today. So I want to invite you to read along with me. If you've got your own Bible or you can turn to your mobile device, pull it out. If your neighbor looks at you, make sure you're not on Facebook or whatever. Um, we're reading from, first of all, Psalm 137, verses 1 through 6. And then we're going to turn to the Gospel of John in just a moment. But hear now these words, Psalm 137, verses 1 through 6. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for myrrh, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Now, the second passage of Scripture we're turning to is from the Gospel of John. John chapter 11, verses 23 through 35. Again, this is a very familiar passage as we know that... uh, Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus that their brother was sick, and Jesus delayed going. And then they receive word as he comes that Lazarus has died. So here are these words, beginning with verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to Jesus... To where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid them, him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. This is the word of God. For you, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we give thanks that we know we've got a God that weeps with us. We give thanks that we've got a God that, that knows the reality of our hurt, the reality of our pain. So Lord, be with us today. May we feel your presence, Emmanuel, God with us. In spite of whatever we may be going through. Lord, may we feel the love that you have for us. I give thanks for your holy word as it's been handed down from generation to generation. And I pray that now in these moments that we share together, that your Holy Spirit would transform the words that proceed from my mouth. And as they fall upon our ears and penetrate our hearts, may they be changed into the word of God that we need to hear today. As individuals and collectively as one body. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, amen. 
When I was a young man, one of my favorite gifts that my parents ever gave to me was a small black and white television that I could have in my own room. I loved having that little TV in my room and uh, it didn't have cable, but it had just what it needed so that in the evening time, I could watch the opening monologue of Johnny Carson in The Tonight Show. I loved listening to Johnny Carson and, and to hear those jokes. Believe it or not, you may be surprised to know that I enjoy humor. And so I loved hearing the humor that he would share. And then every now and then you'd be exposed to different comedians that he might have come on the show. And that's where I fell in love with one particular comedian named Stephen Wright. Any of you ever heard of Stephen Wright? Oh, yeah. yeah. Back in the 80s, I had one of his cassettes. Now, for some of you folks, you may not know what a cassette is. But I, uh, a cassette, it was a way of listening to music. Uh, we didn't have streams. We thought that was just water. But I had this cassette of Stephen Wright, and I loved to listen to it over and over again. And, and, and in general, it was clean comedy, so I could even listen to it in the car with my mom and dad. And so I loved listening to it. Stephen Wright, he had this deadpan delivery. He was about like this. He would just talk so slow and quiet and no energy in the room at all. But he would ask these ridiculous questions in the midst of his performance. Some of my favorite quotes from Stephen Wright. What's another word for thesaurus? <laughs> Get it? What's another word for thesaurus? You, you'd have to, okay. I, one of my others. If you could melt dry ice, could you swim without getting wet? Things to ponder. My favorite one, I think, was if you were in a spaceship going the speed of light and you turn on your headlights, would anything happen? He would ask these ridiculous questions that just seemed to have no answer. There's no way you could really answer some of the questions. And in reality, there are some questions that we just can't seem to answer. For example, what's the color of a mirror? I don't know. It just whatever it reflects. Or is water wet? I don't know. There, there are these kind of questions that are almost impossible to answer. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? This is one of those almost unanswerable questions. And we're in this series called Questions to God, and each week we've been considering these different kind of questions that we want to ask God. And this is one of those impossible questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, who hasn't asked the question, why did this happen to me, God? Why? Why that diagnosis? Why that decision? Why? Why did this happen to me? I've done nothing wrong. I don't deserve this. Why? I don't know about you, but I know I've been through those moments of asking God, why? And in this passage of scripture that I read a few moments ago from the Psalms, about a third of all the Psalms that we have in the book of Psalms are Psalms of lament. There are these words that are just, Israel is crying out. The psalmist is crying out to God, asking, God, look at this. Why? And in this particular passage, uh, Psalm 137, some scholars say that this is the only psalm that we can accurately pinpoint when it was written. Very likely, it was written somewhere between 587 and 539 BCE during the time that the people of Israel have been taken captive. The temple has been destroyed by the Babylonians and they have been taken off. And as the psalm is saying... They're there in Babylon. They have no idea how long they're going to be there. They have no idea how long they're going to have to continue to suffer. And not only are they suffering in the midst of this time, they're being tormented by their captors. Captors. Their captors are saying, oh, sing us a song of Zion. They're just being mocked and ridiculed. And it says that they had hung up their harps on the willows because there is no joy. You know, I only read verses 1 through 6 because if we had read the rest of that passage, and I invite you to do that later on, you'll see that not only are they lamenting what has happened to them, they are asking God for brutal revenge, horrible revenge. I mean, you know, if I was the one that was putting together the Bible, this might be one of those kinds of passages that I said, you know what, this is just a little bit too dark. This is just a little bit too 
too heavy. I, I think I'm going to take that and maybe I won't include that in the book. But I think the reason that that is there is to show us the reality that we have these emotions. We have these feelings. We feel like we have been forgotten. We feel like we have been abandoned by God. That's what the people of Israel are going through. That's what they're experiencing in this time. And so they lament. They're crying out to God. And I think it's included because the reality is God can handle us crying out to him. God's big enough to handle whatever we might throw at God. Back in 1984, the actor Robert Duvall, some of you remember Robert Duvall, he wrote he, by hand, he hand wrote a script, a, a movie that he would eventually develop and make. Robert Duvall, he actually was the son of a, is the son of a Methodist minister. And so he grew up as a part of the faith. And so he wrote the story and it took years to eventually develop the story that became known as the movie, The Apostle. And as he wrote it, he, he wrote the story about a preacher in Texas who finds out that his wife is having an affair with one of his protégés. And so he assaults this individual and then he flees the state and he goes away in hiding. He changes his name. But in the midst of all the turmoil, he seeks refuge at his mother's house. It's one of my favorite scenes in all of movies. And in this scene, you see the house from the outside and you hear the shouting and screaming going on inside of the house. The camera comes in and it shows him inside of this room and he is just walking around shouting and screaming at God at the top of his lungs. The scene then shows the next door neighbor's house and the light coming on. And then you hear a phone ringing and Robert Duvall's character, his mother answers the phone. And she says this line. As the person is calling to inquire about all the yelling and screaming that's going on. She said, that's my son, that is. I'll tell you, ever since he was an itty-bitty boy, sometimes he talks to the Lord. and Sometimes he yells at the Lord. Tonight, he just happens to be yelling at him. <laughs> I love that line. Sometimes, don't you feel like yelling? Sometimes, don't you feel like that? I mean, he's going through it. He can't believe the way that he's been betrayed. He can't believe the way that he's betrayed who he is and his own actions. He can't believe it. And he is just mad. He's upset. He's overcome. And he's letting it all go. You know what the beautiful thing is? God is able to bear even our most difficult moments. God can handle it. And it seem, when it seems like we've learned somewhere that we can't question God or that it's, it's not a part of the faith to ever question God or to doubt God. But the reality is, read the Psalms and you'll see over and over again those times of questioning. Those questioning and those hard and difficult moments. And God is big enough to handle our questions. So why do we hold it in? Why do we hold it to ourselves? I mean, lament is a valid and expected response to suffering. And we don't need to edit it out of our story. It's not edited out of this story so that we could see the reality is that God can handle those difficult emotions. The psalmist doesn't try to answer why this has happened to him. I mean, really, why do bad things happen to good people is truly an impossible question, a question we can't answer on this side of heaven. We may never know the answers. But as God's people face oppression, as God's people go through different challenges and hardships throughout history, God is there and God is faithful. God cares when we suffer. God cares when anyone suffers. And God responds. Maybe not when we want him to. Maybe not in the way that we would want him to. But God responds. We see this pattern throughout the scriptures. That in the midst of the suffering, God is there. And we see it beautifully in this passage of scripture about the story of Lazarus. You know, I've often wondered what kind of questions were Martha and Mary asking each other. During this time of waiting. They had sent word to Jesus. They know that if Jesus could come. Their brother wouldn't die. 
But now he's died. Why? God, didn't you even care? Didn't you even care that our brother, your loved one, was dying? Jesus, didn't you even care? And Jesus comes. I love it. One sister comes out to greet him right away, but the other stays back. You know, I can just picture. She's mad. She's angry. She doesn't even want to see his face. But finally, she comes out. She says the exact same thing that her sister had already said to Jesus, which tells us this has been a conversation point. That if Jesus had only come, that he wouldn't have died. And in the midst of all the weeping and all the crying and the anger and the bitterness that they have felt and are experiencing, Jesus weeps. I love that. I love that I have a God that when I cry, he cries with me. I love it that I have a God that is right there in the midst of my suffering that knows everything that I'm going through. I love it that I have a God that loves me even when I'm angry at him. Even when I'm upset, that God still loves me. I think here, Jesus turns the question, why do bad things happen to good people? He, I think he turns it into why do good people happen to bad things? See, that's the thing. When we go through these times of suffering, we don't go through them alone. Good comes alongside us. Think about those most difficult moments in your life and the way that somebody came alongside you in that moment. And I honestly think that if more times good happened to the bad things that have happened in our lives, more people would truly stay in love with God. The problem is sometimes when we go through these hard times, we fall away. But I think that's the challenge to you and to me to come alongside when somebody's going through those difficult moments that we come alongside to let them know you're not going through this alone. These bad things that have happened to you, good things are going to surround you. I think about in the moments that after my mother's passing. And I know I've shared about that before, but I I think about in those days following my mother's unexpected death, how the way that we were loved and surrounded By people that cared for us. Now, I remember thinking very vividly of that old poem, uh, Footprints. I know you know of that story about the person walking along the beach and they see two sets of footprints. But in their most difficult moments in life, they only see one set of footprints. And they ask God, why did you forsake me? Why did you leave me alone? And God responds, those are my feet as I carried you. I couldn't help but think that in the time, that, that, that moments following my mother's death and the way that people surrounded us and loved us, it wasn't just one set of footprints. There was hundreds of footprints. Because good things, good people happened in the midst of a bad thing. I think that's our challenge. So number one today. Maybe you're one of those people that feel like you have been forsaken. Maybe you're one of those people that feel like you have been forgotten. Maybe you're one of those that feel like God has abandoned you. Why has this happened to me? If that's you today, you know what? It's okay to cry out. It's okay to yell and scream. Maybe not right in this moment, but it's okay. Write a letter to God. Write a letter to God saying, God, I'm angry right now. And I, I don't understand why you've allowed this to happen. I don't get it. Why, God? Where are you, God? It's okay. Write it out in the letter or tell it to a neighbor. Tell it to me. Let it out. Express it. The reality of what you're experiencing. God can handle it. I promise you. And God is not going to get angry at you. God is going to look upon you and love you even more than what you think. Even more than you could ever understand. Because God sees you being real. You know, God sees you. You know what? I I, I can tell when I walk in the door if my wife's upset with me or not. I I can just see it on her face. I can hear it in her voice. And if I say, honey, how are you? She says, fine. I know it's not fine. God knows when we're lying to him. Don't don't praise God in the midst of... I mean, yes, praise God in the storm. I loved the music today. But there are times the reality is we've got to say, God, I'm not right. I'm not right right now. Maybe that's you today. If that's not you today, 
then be the good that happens to those that are in that. Be the ones that surround somebody in the midst of their darkest moments. Be the one that offers the, to come alongside. You don't have to tell them anything to make them feel better. Just be there. Be present. Because, folks, this world can feel so alone. Remind somebody they are not alone. Today. Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. But I know this. Good people happen to bad things. And I think that's the way that we're called to live out our faith. To come alongside somebody in the midst of those difficult moments. May you be the good that happens to the bad. Let us pray. God, I don't understand all the difficult things that we go through in life. I wish that there was no pain or suffering. But the reality is we are betrayed. The reality is hardship comes upon us that we never expected. And sometimes we don't know what to do with that. So God, may we be willing to just give it all to you. Even if we don't understand, we just give it to you. But may we feel just like Jesus came alongside Martha and Mary. That he wept with them. They knew that they were not alone in that moment. And we have a God that is willing to bear up our suffering. We have a God that is willing to suffer alongside us. A God that is willing to offer up his life. As a sacrifice for us. A God that is with us. Emmanuel. So God, there may be people in our, heart, in our lives that we've been holding in our hearts and our minds that we've been lifting up to you in prayer. But Lord, may those prayers become an, a life. May those prayers become an action as we go alongside to be the good in the midst of the hard, in the midst of the bad things that have happened. May we be the body of Christ. May we be with those who suffer. God, we pray all this today in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us again next week. In the meantime, you can find us online at orangemethodist.org.